Um, so, okay, so let me just quickly recall things that we were doing. So in lecture one, um, we, we dealt with uh, space of all marked hyperbolic metrics on compact surface. And of course, we were always assuming that the Euler characteristic is negative. And this was Dijkmuller space. Um, and we showed that it's homeomorphic to an open cell. Um, in lecture two, um, so this was somehow so geometric. So in lecture two, we uh, moved to groups and, and we thought of um, um, spaces as the, the space of geometric structures. So there's a, there's a deformation space of um, sort of PSL2 RH2 structures, um, which are also marked. And, and uh, we identified Dijkmuller space with discrete faithful representations into PSL2R, the fundamental group of the surface to PSL2R, and that was the holonomy map. Okay, so, um, so this was um, so lecture two, and I also said that this uh, subset here, this is a subset of the representation variety. It's a, it's a component of corresponding representation variety, PSL2. So this was uh, somehow sort of the algebraic side of things. Um, so I didn't get around to sort of giving you the proof of this, but let me, I'm, I can't resist saying a little bit about this. So, um, so you have to show that this set is both open and closed. So kind of openness, uh, I, I, um, so you can believe it's an, it's an injective map from here. If you perturb a discrete faithful representation, uh, you still get something discrete faithful. Okay, so it can correspond to geometric objects here. Here you get a nearby uh, marked hyperbolic surface. What about closeness? So the claim is that if you have a sequence of discrete faithful representations converging to some representation, um, Um, so then, um, so this uh, limiting representation is also discrete and faithful. Okay. This is what you would like to um, prove for um, closeness, okay. and which I said is a theorem of Chakro, um, and she proved it in slightly more generality. So, um, so here's one argument, and this sort of um, uh, says how you can go back and forth between this geometric uh, viewpoint and algebraic one. So this is a completely algebraic statement. So by the way, these representations converging to a representation means that for every gamma in the fundamental group of S, those matrices that you get, the image of the representations converge. Right? So that is what it means. Um, so, so suppose not. So suppose not. Um, so then... What, so suppose this limiting representation is not discrete and, uh, and faithful. Okay, so so then there exists a sequence of loops in pi one of s such that rho of gamma n converges to the identity as n. Okay, this is just uh, if you unravel what it means to be not discrete and faithful. This is what it means. I mean, either it's not faithful in which you can take gamma n to be a constant sort of sequence. Okay, so. Um, all right, so, uh, so what, it mean, what does it mean uh, in the quotient surfaces? So, so, let, uh, so remember that all of these are discrete and faithful, so you can form these marked hyperbolic surfaces by taking the quotient with this image uh, groups under these row ends. Okay, so th these are the hyperbolic surfaces. So in the hyperbolic surface, this loop gamma n would be something which is short. Okay, because uh, it's, it's, uh, for large n, it is close to the identity, and it's this hyperbolic element with a very short translation distance. Okay, so um, so uh, so then so this implies that uh, so the uh, so there exists 
uh, loops gamma n on xn such that the length of gamma n on xn goes to zero as uh, n tends to infinity. Now, these loops may not be quite be simple, okay? So, uh, we don't know what they are. There are some elements of the fundamental group. But if you have uh, loops on the surface, you, you can, uh, can cut them into pieces which are simple, okay? And then, uh, so this says that from here, it's not hard to see that there actually exist simple loops which don't intersect itself. Let's call it gamma prime, so that the same thing happens. Okay, so, so if you have on the surface uh, some loop like the figure eight, which intersects uh, itself, well, this you can think of as giving rise to two sort of simple loops, okay, and each of them would, would have sort of lengths less than the original, and you homotope it to that geodesic. One of them has to be non-trivial, and, and then you get these gamma primes. Okay, um, all right, but there's a topological fact which you can try proving if you ask. So um, that on, on your surface SGB, okay, so th there exists, there is a, you can have a curve, there is a, 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 a curve, not necessarily simple, let's, go, let's say alpha, but the closed curve, that intersects, essentially intersects, um, infinitely many of these gamma ions. In fact, maybe all of them, actually. So infinitely many of these gamma n primes. Okay, so there's a, so here's gamma n primes, a sequence of simple closed curves on the surface. Okay, you can take what is called a filling curve, because okay, uh, something which would essentially intersect every you know, sort of one of these. Now, what do you know about curves intersecting a short curve? Well, if you remember last class, I told you about the color lemma. Okay, so this would imply, so this implies whether so the color lemma or the Margulis lemma, so, so that plays a crucial role in this proof. This implies that the length of that curve, which is intersecting gamma n prime, has to go to infinity. Okay, so, uh, so you're, you're you're crossing this, these shorter and shorter curves. And, and, and uh, in fact, the, um, yeah, so the color lemma, the size of the color was independent of, of anything, actually. So it's a, a independent of the hyperbolic metric. Um, and and so, so, so if this happens, so this means that this, so remember the lengths and traces are kind of, are, are, uh, uh, his uh, lens determine the traces of the matrix and vice versa. So it means that this uh, element rho of alpha, okay, so the trace of that in the, uh, so in the, the space PSL2R is, is going to infinity, right? So this is, uh, and then this element is diverging um, in the space of, you know, in, in the space of these matrices. And um, yeah, so, so this sort of contradicts the fact that you've assumed that the row ends converge to some element row. Okay, so, so here you have to kind of, uh, yeah, so, you, so, so you, have to, you look at the traces and so on, so I'm, I'm kind of um, hiding some things here. So this, but let me just say that this fact, that there's some length which is diverging here, contradicts, um, uh, contradicts the fact that you have this convergence, this star, okay, so. Okay, so this is sort of a kind of a, um, this is a sketch of an argument where, we could, where yeah, so to so point out that this geometric fact that of the, like the color lemma, the Margulis lemma plays a role in, in proving something like this, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so, so that was uh, something left over from last time. So I should also remark that uh, this is a component, as I, uh, mentioned that there are other components of this representation space. Um, um, in fact, um, it for there, there are uh, four G minus three components. These are labeled by an integer. Um, 
E rho, that's the sort of the Euler class of the representation. And that that's, has to be something between um, minus 2g plus 2 and 2g minus 2. And, and, and one of these components uh, is, the, is this space of discrete faithful things that we are looking at is the Teichmuller's component, okay? So it's Teichmuller's space, okay? Um, and uh, there, there's um, another component corresponding to the, you know, the other extreme value of this uh, integer, whatever it is. Uh, uh, so also has um, discrete faithful representations, but it corresponds to um, hyperbolic metrics on um, S bar. So S uh, is an oriented surface. This, you can uh, take the other orientation of the surface, and this gives you... Um, uh, so, so here, the hyperbolic metrics on the on the on S bar gives you actually another component. And but there are um, so there are these two extreme components which are nice. They have all these they're associated with these geometric structures. So this one is the Steichmuller space. Um, and but there are all these other ones in between, and which are still somewhat mysterious. Um, and, and these contain things like indiscrete representations of pi 1s into PSL 2r. Um, and it contains uh, hyperbolic metrics with cone uh, singularities. Okay, and, and so on. And it contains discrete but not faithful representations, you know, things like that. And, and um, so. Uh, so these are still, you know, sort of um, uh, complete understanding is not quite there. Yet. Okay. So, um, yes. Right, right. So this is actually, I should say that it's a, it's a result. All this is a result of Bill Goldman, in the mid '80s, 1980s. So, um, yeah. So he, he showed that for every one of these integers, there's an exactly one component. Yeah. So, all right. Okay, so um, so today I'm going to talk about the mapping class group action. On uh, Teichmuller space. So that's the plan, so I'll now switch to this dynamics. Um, by the way, so um, since I have this picture, the mapping class group action um, on these other components are quite mysterious. There are many open questions about that. And it's not known, there are several conjectures, but it's not known what the action is like. And okay, so, um, so what's the mapping class group? Um, so we kind of secretly saw it already. So let me sort of set up some notation. So definition slash notation. So you have, uh, you can look at homeomorphisms of the surface. So sometimes I'll drop this G and B. Um, homeomorphisms, uh, this plus means you're looking at orientation preserving homeomorphisms. Um, and you have the uh, a sitting, so this forms a group by, just by composition. If you compose homeomorphisms, homeomorphism. Um, you have a subgroup in system of orientation preserving homeomorphisms that are homotopic to the identity map. Okay, so homotopic to the identity map, which is also homeomorphism. And, and the mapping class group uh, is the quotient. Okay, so um, so you look at all orientation preserving um, homeomorphisms. You you quotient by things which are homotopic to the identity, and you can, uh, you can convince yourself that's nothing but looking at orientation preserving homeomorphisms up to homotop. Okay, so uh, so these are just uh, orientation preserving homeomorphisms of S. Um, 
up to homotopy. This you've already seen. These are these markings, right? So, but except now I'm going to think of these as group, as a group, right? So you can compose homeomorphisms and, and, and I'm going to think of these as maps of the surface to itself rather than some fitting on the surface. So, um, so that's the mapping class group. And, and what have we seen so far? The examples that we've uh, seen are, um, so, so the mapping class group of a disk is a trivial um, element. Yes. No, so I'm not assuming that. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, so I, 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 uh, in my talk here, I will, we assume that you are allowed to move points in the boundary. Okay, so um, of course these boundary, and the boundary com components might be permuted also by this. So they have to be, boundary component must go to a boundary component. But uh, so this homotop is not a relative homot uh, relative to the boundary. Okay, so okay, so um, yeah. Um, so this uh, yeah. So the terminology might differ from place to place, and there's some distinction between what is called the pure mapping class group and the mapping class group. But I'm going to not fix points in the boundary. The homotopy is allowed. To be. So th so that's why this mapping class group of an annulus. So uh, let me call it S zero two is. Um, is Z mod 2Z. This is uh, these two things that uh, you, you allow the boundaries to flip or boundaries are preserved. This we saw last time, right? right? So, um, um, uh, so, so if, you, if you allow, so note that uh, if uh, you require that the homotopy, that the homotopy uh, fixes boundary point-wise, okay, so fixes um, boundaries point-wise, then you get a lot more homeomorphism. So then if you look at a map of this annulus to the annulus, okay, so let's call it tau, that twists. So suppose I, I, this is some kind of longitudinal arc. Uh, you can have something that, um, that goes around. So, so it's a homeomorphism where... Uh, so, uh, which which twists once around. Okay, so so the resulting map is 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 fixing points in the boundaries. Okay, but this uh, is not homotopic. Uh, tau is not homotopic to the identity map. Um, if if you require that the homotopy fixes the boundary point, so to so untwist you have to move the boundary. Okay. And this is called a Dane twist, by the way. So this, uh, this map is called a Dane twist. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to, uh, yeah, so, so allow um, things to move um, points on the boundary. Uh, so similarly, mapping class group of a uh, uh, three-hold sphere, pair of pants, is Z mod 3Z. So this is also something that we saw. So these are the... All of these correspond to all the possible markings. What happens for a four punctured, so four um, hold sphere? So, um, so here you have a picture. Well, here, so what you can do is if you take this curve gamma, you can do these kind of Dane twists. Uh, around gamma, okay, and so so think of this as a as an annulus sitting inside around gamma. So here, um, if you do a Dane twist, so if you if you um, if you twist around uh, um, so this annulus, you're keeping the re the homeomorphism fixes the rest of the surface, okay. And you're just moving the points inside them. That's a non-trivial mapping class. Okay? It's not homotopic to the identity. Okay, and and so and you can keep doing it. So Dane twists along gamma um, give um, so an iteration. So powers of a, so Dane twist along gamma and its powers iterations of this give uh, non-trivial 
mapping classes, okay? So none of them are homotopic to identity or to each other. So this becomes an infinite group. Okay, so there are um, a lot of these. You can iterate this. You can choose a different curve also. You can choose, you know, so a, uh, this curve and then do Dane twists around this. So all of these give you um, mapping classes. Okay, so it becomes an interesting sort of large group. So, so more generally, what we have is following facts. Um, so, um, so let's let's mention a few facts. So, um, more generally, so so firstly, this mapping class group of a surface um, is generated by Dane twists. Okay, generated by uh, Dane twists along simple closed curves. curves uh, so it's always some kind of infinite group. Okay, so um, uh, uh, secondly, um, just to point out the mapping class group, I should have done that before, but the mapping class group, the surface is a discrete group. Okay, so you can, um, yeah, so if you talk of homeomorphisms, you can, you measure you know, that some you can give the space of all homeomorphisms some topology. Right? So you do homeomorphisms are closed, you fix some metric on the surface if you want to close in the C infinity topology or something. If you have two homeomorphisms which are very close to each other on a compact surface, they can be homotop to each other. Okay, so you can so you can convince yourself of that. So this is actually a discrete group. Um, and and so uh, uh, so there's also this some so algebraic description of all this. So a mapping class, uh, a phi belonging to the mapping class group of the surface, induces an automorphism of the fundamental group. Because if you look at the induced map at the level of fundamental groups, this is an automorphism, right? Of, um, and the, there's a theorem of uh, an old theorem of Dane, Nielsen, uh, Baer, that. Um, so this assignment, so there's a mapping class group. Um, well, I, this time I have to sort of allow orientation reversing homeomorphisms also. So this ex some kind of extended mapping class group is actually um, so equal to, so under this uh, map, so it's isomorphic to um, the outer automorphisms of pi 1 of s, which is just the uh, automorphisms of the group by quotiented with inner automorphisms, the ones that act by conjugation. Okay, so elements that act with conservation. So in any case, uh, I, I don't want to spend time on this, but uh, it is an algebraic, purely algebraic way that you can understand um, the mapping class group, okay, so instead of topological. Yes? Yeah. So, sorry, can you? Ah, okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, um, let me, uh, for the purposes of this, in fact, this uh, Dane Nielsen Baer theorem is also for S closed. So I'm going to uh, say that all of these are for S closed. Okay, so this is for a closed surface. Um, yeah, so here we might need to sort of add some moves along arcs. And, yeah, that's a good point. So S is a closed surface. I'm not going to go into otherwise you have to look at half twists or something. Yes. Yeah. So the mapping class group S acts on tight Muller space. How does it do that? Well, let's just say phi is in the mapping class group. Um, then what is phi acting on some marked surface? So XF is, as you remember, is some hyperbolic surface in a marking that's in tight Muller space. So what does, uh, how does this work? Well, so I'll, I'll use this definitely. I'll, I'll say that this is nothing but F followed by phi. Okay, so somehow this was the picture where this was the marked surface, the marking. I'm going to, this is a, 
surface is homeomorphic to it. So it's just some, some, I'm going to act hit this with the mapping class. So this will be permute. So this gives already gives you some marking on the surface. I'm going to permute those curves somehow. So change the curves by a homeomorphism. Okay, that's going to give me a new marking. This composition, phi composed with f, is a new marking. Somehow the hyperbolic surface remains the same. Yeah, but I've changed the marking. Okay, so um, um, and but in terms of representation, so if you view the Eichmuller space as uh, um, so as some discrete faithful representation, this is equivalent to the following. So if you look at uh, uh, some discrete faithful representation. And what's a phi acting on this faithful representation? What does it do? Well, you pre-compose your representation with this, um, with the inverse of this induced aut automorphism. Okay, so so remember that rho is some representation. It goes from pi one of s to PSL two r. So uh, phi is some mapping class that induces an automorphism of the fundamental group. So you kind of pre-compose with inverse this phi inverse is there just to make it a group action okay and and and, so, and you get a new representation of, the, of that fixed by one of s and that's going to give uh, uh, your new point okay so in both ways you can describe this action and you can check that you know this is a this is a, a group action okay so I'm not doing that. action of the of mcgs as a group on on tighten the space and the main theorem today is uh, the following that um, so so we, I'm going to prove that um, the mapping class group um, action on Teichmuller space is properly discontinuous. It's a nice enough action. Okay, so okay, so um, so recall what proper discontinuity means. As I probably I said it earlier, but uh, um, the properly discontinuous action would mean that if you so that's Teichmuller space, and if we take a compact set in Teichmuller space, then only finitely many elements of the mapping class group will hit. If you hit it with K with this. They'll overlap with K again. Okay, so um, so it's uh, this action sort of spreads, orbits are spread apart. Okay, so um, if you look at all the elements of the mapping class group, which so that um, if you hit compact set with this intersects itself, then the number of such elements is actually finite. Okay, this is what proper means. So K is some compact set. Properly discontinuous means okay. So um, okay. So um, so this is what we're going to now do. Um, by the way, so here I should uh, also mention that um, so so this would mean that there's a nice quotient, uh, uh, and and this quotient is at least a Hausdorff quotient, right? So um, so the quotient of the of Teichmuller space with the mapping class group and quotient by this action is uh, what is called the moduli space. It's a moduli space of Riemann surfaces uh, also. Right? So, so you know that by uniformization, any Riemann surface is hyperbolic, it's a unique hyperbolic metric. So these two things are actually sort of equivalent to each other. This is you, so you recover this moduli space of Riemann uh, by this process. Okay, so and um, so. So in terms of the hyperbolic geometry, well, what this moduli space now is, is this all the space of, now you're forgetting the markings because this mapping class group acts by permuting these markings. Right? So, um, so if you quotient out, uh, you're kind of forgetting the markings. So it will just be x is a, all the collection of hyperbolic metric on this S. Okay, so, uh, so all the such hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, and and when when are these two equivalent? So these uh, if they are isometric, okay. So where x1 equivalent to x2, if and only if there is uh, isometry. So now you don't have to worry about markings or something. Anything like that. 
Okay, so this is the moduli space. Okay, and it, um, and as we saw that um, Teichmuller space is a rather simple topological space, R to the something, but uh, uh, moduli space is quite complicated because the mapping class group is complicated. Okay, so somehow, the study of, uh, yeah, so moduli space is often, because of this, reduced to somehow studying the mapping class group. And so there's a lot of interaction between, let's say, sort of geometry group theory and and, and so on, the study of moduli space. Okay, so, um, okay. Um, so, so to uh, to start, we need uh, uh, this following fact, this lemma that. Um, Um, some basic kind of starting point of many things is that if you have, um, so let X be a hyperbolic, a compact hyperbolic surface, and L to be some positive real, then the number of closed geodesics gamma um, as a closed geodesic on x of length less than l, so the number of this is finite. Okay, so. so if you start with a hyperbolic, compact hyperbolic surface and you fix some upper bound and length, then the number of curves you can draw of bounded length, actually finite. So I should say it's homotopy classes, okay? So, well, I already said geodesics, right? So there's only one geodesic in every homotopy class. So, but in general, you know, so if you talk of curves, uh, so in any homotopy class, homotopy classes of curves with bounded length are finite. Okay, so let me uh, give this a, a name. So this is, let's say, um, sort of script C L. Okay, the, so why is this true? Well, you've already seen that if you have a hyperbolic surface, it's a quotient of the upper half plane by a, some discrete group, right? There's a Fuchsian group. So, uh, so, uh, so, so recall that um, X is H2 on gamma, where this gamma is some subgroup of PSL2R, um, and it acts, which acts properly discontinuously. Okay, so, um, so the picture was as follows. Here was H2, and you had gamma acting properly discontinuously, and the quotient give you, gives you this your X. Okay, so suppose, um, so in particular there is a, some kind of fundamental domain. So and we're starting with a compact surface, some kind of compact, some fundamental domain. So F, let F be a compact fundamental domain for this action. Okay, so, so now if you start with some closed geodesic uh, on X, uh, and I'll draw a simple uh, closed curve, but uh, yeah, so, so if let's talk and say gamma, then uh, what do you know? Well, so this gamma must be coming from the quotient of some axis here. That's getting a quotient to do. So this is the picture we saw last time. Okay, so there's an infinite here to say when you pass through the universal cover, the, the lift of gamma, one of the lifts of gamma, uh, would be something like this, which passes through the fundamental domain. Okay, so um, so let um, a gamma tilde. So so if Gamma uh, is something in, let's say, C L is set. Then uh, gamma tilde, and then pick a lift. Gamma tilde passing through through um, F. So um, what what it gives you is that you. So you know it is it is in this set C L. So, so the length of gamma is less than L, which means that on this, in this axis, this group gamma, this element corresponding to gamma is acting by translations 
of length less than L. Okay, this is what it uh, means. So, uh, so you can, if you pick a point in the fundamental domain, um, so, so uh, belonging to this gamma tilde, so there exists some H in the fundamental domain um, such that uh, the distance, the hyperbolic distance from X to, uh, where, so this is the action of the, uh, of the, of the uh, fundamental group on H2. Okay, so gamma of X acts on uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this space, and it acts by translating things along this geodesic axis. So if you pick uh, a point X over here, this translation length is going to be less than L. Okay, so, this is, so there's some point in X, so let's, let's call it so that uh, if you pick a point, this translation length. So which means that this gamma x, where, where this point goes, belongs to some neighborhood of this compact, L neighborhood uh, of this, all the points in distance less than or equal to L, let's say, of, of, the, of this compact set um, F, okay? Which is also compact, by the way. So you're just thickening your, uh, your F to some uh, L size neighborhood. So if you picked a point X along this axis, here this translation length is L, so it's going to land inside um, this thickening again. Okay. So um, so now so if uh, this and this happens for every element uh, here, and this is here. So if this was infinite, if this size of the set was infinite, so then uh, you would get uh, for each of these you would get some gamma, so that this happens. Okay, so, so, so here this sort of, uh, so then uh, the number of, uh, of the elements of gamma, such that uh, uh, your gamma of this compact set intersected with itself is non-empty, is overlaps, will become infinite, right? So, um, so, uh, so each of these axes would give you points which kind of, so, so if you move this thickened thing, it will intersect itself. Okay, something in this in, inner thing would in, again intersect itself, but that contradicts proper discontinuity. Okay, so it contradicts the fact that it acts properly discontinuous. Okay, so um, let's call it star. Okay, so it's uh, just from the action of uh, gamma on H two, you can conclude that uh, so the, since points uh, move on, part that there's a you can't have infinitely many curves of bounded length, so because they would correspond to these orbit points, and uh, they can't have infinitely many in any compact set. Okay, so um, so how does the proof of this theorem now go? So um, so let's start. Um, so suppose not. Then, this means that there's some compact set in Teichmuller space, right? So that uh, infinitely many mapping classes that intersect, you know, take this compact set to something that intersects it, uh, itself. So, um, so then there exists infinitely many, um, so with a pairwise distinct, let's say. We want infinitely many, that's the... Um, that's the contradiction. The mapping classes phi n belonging to mapping class group, such that phi n, you hit k with phi n, it intersects itself. Okay, so this is what it means. And there is a oh sorry, I said there's also a, a compact set. Okay, so there exists a compact set in Teichmuller space, and infinitely many such things, so that this happens. Okay, so so in particular. Um, so th there exists some bunch of points in this uh, compact set such that a phi n of x n also belongs to the compact, set, right? So that's what uh, it really amounts to. Okay. So now, um, uh, so th this would mean that if you fix um, any generator of the so fix any uh, generator. 
alpha of pi 1 of s, uh, some curve, let's say some curve, I've fixed some generator. So then, um, so since these phi n xn's all lie in some compact set, and you know that length functions are continuous, you would know that the length of this alpha on these phi n xn's are, uh, is bounded, okay, so uniformly. Okay, so this is something that follows from, um, uh, so since length functions, the length function L alpha is uh, continuous, and you are, uh, so everything, all these phi n extends lies in a compact set. So for some B. Okay, so there exists, so I should say that then there exists some B such that this happens for all n. Okay, so this is, uh, now, now what is this? Well, so here, uh, so I should really say phi n dot xn. Okay, so here, even here. So this is the phi n acting on xn. Okay, so, um, so, so this is nothing but, so remember the phi n is just, so alpha, so xn comes with a marking. I've not written this xn fn's, okay, so the xn comes with a marking, alpha is thrown onto xn, and then you're hitting it with phi n. Okay, so if, so on the resulting surface, you're saying that that length alpha is less than b n, b less than equal to b uniformly. But this is nothing but saying, so the action of how we've defined action is a phi n alpha on x n is less than b. Okay, so on this hyperbolic surface x, x n, this curve is, uh, is uniformly bounded length. Um, and I'm going to give these, so that here for each um, n, you have this phi n of alpha. So let's give them a name. So we shall call, uh, so uh, uh, we shall denote uh, uh, these curves by uh, alpha n. So these are these uh, defined to be these bunch of curves. Okay, so on this. So, and, and we are going to contradict this fact, okay, the fact that uh, yeah, so this, so this, so these bunch of curves, there's a uniformly bounded uh, length. Okay, so you want a contradiction eventually, so this is going to be the contradiction. Okay, so the first um, claim is, um, actually, let me, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it could be, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, it could be, uh, yeah, so the infinitely many, I want these mapping classes to be infinitely many, okay? So, accents could very well be when one point, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the first claim, so, so yeah, so let me just say, so the, let's call this uh, box thing star, and so we shall contradict, so the goal is to contradict um, star. So alpha, I said, was any generator of the fundamental group, and you're looking at p n alphas, and looking at the lens of the universe. So claim one is that this alpha n's uh, must be infinitely many distinct curves. Okay, so uh, let's see. So, um, so for some generator alpha of pi 1 of s, um, the sequence alpha n has infinitely many pairwise distinct curves. Where I, this time I mean, by distinct I mean in homotopy, they're not, so to be, if they're, they're the same, if they're homotopic to each other. So here, so they're homotopic the homotopy classes are different from uh, infinitely many of them. Why? Because suppose these alpha n's, this is in some, so you're starting with a single alpha and you're hitting it with the mapping class. So you're getting more and more curves, you're getting complicated. So uh, suppose you eventually, you know, get the same curves. Or something. So then, uh, then, so suppose, so if not, uh, I mean, then what would happen is that uh, your, um, uh, so, uh, alpha, so phi 
n of you know, alpha uh, belongs to some finite set of, of curves. Okay, so gamma one, gamma n, let's say. Um, okay, so some kind of finite set of curves. Okay, so uh, so for for each n, so so you are only if, suppose you only have finitely many things in the sequence, and this happens for each generator, for each alpha a generator of pi one of s. But um, um, a mapping class is determined by where it sends these generators, right? So this means that uh, this would imply that uh, your phi n's themselves must belong to finitely many mapping classes. So because there are only finitely many choices of where these generators can go. Okay, so phi n belongs to only some finite set of mapping classes. Okay, a finite set. But that's a, a contradiction. It contradicts our assumption, okay, that uh, if phi n's are infinitely many distinct mapping classes. Okay, so, so this claim one is uh, easy. So this is claim one. Um, claim two is that um, it's slightly more geometric. It says that um, so now we, we know that on the surface there's a bunch of these curves which are infinitely many curves. Okay, none of them are, uh, yeah, so they kind of, uh, uh, so yeah, the infinitely many are pairwise, sort of not homotopic to each other. You have says uh, infinitely many curves. So claim two is that there exists a, a pants decomposition P, let's call it script P, of our surface S, um, such that um, these curves alpha N intersects some pants curve, some fixed pants curve in this pants uh, decomposition, let's call it gamma, um, an unbounded number of times, okay? So, unboundedly many times, okay? So, um, so what does this mean? So, intersection, by intersection, uh, I'll always mean uh, an essential intersection. So, intersection means that um, your curves, uh, how do you measure the intersection between two curves? Uh, you, you look, this is, uh, can define what is called an intersection number. So this intersection number is you look at, um, well, the number of points, uh, you know, just the points where these curves intersect, but you kind of minimize over homotopy classes. So you minimize the number of these intersection points as you homotope the uh, these curves, alpha n prime is homotopic to alpha n, gamma prime is homotopic to gamma, and I try to minimize it, and this is called the intersection number. It's sort of a uh, so topological in in invariant. Um, the claim is that there is a pants decomposition. So you, here you have a bunch of curves, infinitely many, um, and we know that we, they are you know, distinct. A lot of these, you can choose a subsequence that all of them are pairwise distinct. The claim is that there's some pants decomposition so that these alpha n's would intersect L gamma um, unboundedly many times. So uh, this means that the intersection number with gamma goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Okay, so what's the proof? Well, you pick any pants decomposition, start with the pants decomposition, so pick some pants decomposition, P. Um, so if this doesn't happen, so if a claim does not hold. Um, so what's the picture like? So here's a closed surface, say, and here's maybe a pants decomposition. Um, so suppose your, so your alpha ends are some uh, curves in the picture, right, which I'm not drawing. So maybe it's kind of runs around and I, I don't know. So some alpha n run. So suppose the number of uh, so, in, so intersections with each of these pants curves is, is just uh, uniformly bounded. Then, well, the number of arcs you see in these complements, in these pairs of pants, is also uniformly bounded. Only, then that tells you that um, 
Well, the only thing that you can do to get infinitely many distinct curves is that you're going to be twisting around some pants curve unboundedly many times. Otherwise, if you're not twisting around the pants curves, you're running around there are only finitely many possibilities because there are finitely many, uniformly boundedly many arcs in the complement. Okay, so, um, so by claim two, um, so alpha n's are uh, sort of infinitely many curves. So, um, so um, I can say that. Uh, so they are pairwise. Sort of, can we can assume that alpha n's are, uh, after passing to a subsequence, are pairwise distinct and they're homotopically distinct. Sorry, claim one, yeah. So by claim one, they're pairwise distinct. Uh, so um, uh, alpha n uh, must be accumulating some twists. So this implies uh, that alpha n has unboundedly many twists about some pants curve. Gamma. Okay, so, uh, so uh, this is something that um, follows. Um, now, what do you do then? Uh, well, you really want a pants decomposition where um, it intersects it in infinite many, so you change your pants decomposition. This state. So, um, so, so you could have uh, some pants curve, let's say, on this side of the picture, and maybe these uh, alpha n's, they start kind of twisting more and more around this curve, gamma. Okay? So then what you do is you um, so change your pants decomposition, so change your uh, change p to a new pants decomposition, P prime by replacing gamma by P gamma. So remember there was this dual curve that we talked about when doing with differential Nielsen coordinates. There was a dual curve P gamma, which, was, which looked like this in the picture. Okay, so in this picture it looked like this. If your uh, pants curve was uh, separating, so suppose it looked like uh, the gamma looked like this, then your B gamma was something like that. Okay, so if, so now um, your intersection numbers with B gamma, so now you have a new pants decomposition. You can check that this again defines a, a new pants decomposition because okay, so you get a simple set of simple closed, maximal collection of simple closed curves which are break it up into a pair of pants, decompose the surface. But, but if you're twisting unboundedly many times around gamma, you're going to intersect your curve B gamma. Okay, so, um, so this time, uh, this goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, and you're done. You've, uh, you've built a pants decomposition which works. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so as a corollary of this, now, you have the fact that um, the corollary is that the length of, um, of uh, our um, alpha n's on x n's goes to infinity. So this is the contradiction that we were seeking. Okay? Um, why? Because, well, um, remember, recall that Xn's all belong to some compact set, K. Okay, so 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 um, uh, so since they all belong to some compact set K, your gamma, the length of gamma on these Xn's has a uniform upper bound. Okay, let's call it capital L naught. So again, this length function is continuous. Is a uniform upper bound. Uh, so, which means that in all these surfaces, so if you draw gamma on our Xn, so this gamma is some length bounded above, which means that by the color lemma, here the color lemma comes again, there is a definite sized color around it. Okay, so 
um, by the color lemma. Um, Um, uh, so there's this definite size collar. There is a, a collar of size eta of L naught uh, around gamma on the surface X naught, Xn. Okay, so, um, uh, and remember that as your length in decreases, the collar actually widens. So, but there's this uniform size for all these surfaces. Okay, so this, what does this mean? It means, you also know that these, alpha n's intersect gamma more and more. Okay, so, uh, so each time alpha n intersects, it has to pass through this color. Okay, so, so the length of alpha n xn has to be greater than or equal to um, uh, the intersection number of alpha n with gamma times this eta of um, L naught. Okay, so this uh, every time, or maybe twice the eta of L naught. Okay, so it has to pass through this column. Okay? Um, but this, we know, goes to infinity. So, so we are done. So, um, but I claim one, claim two uh, implies that the intersection number goes to infinity. Okay, so, um, so indeed, these alpha n's, of the lengths of these go to infinity, and that finally contradicts uh, this statement that uh, the lengths are all uniform. The boundary. Okay, so um, anyway, it, maybe it was uh, long-winded, but it had the, all these geometric um, things that we we um, seeing them in use. You know, so things like the color lemma and this fancy decomposition, which was a, that we had in the previous talk, so we could use all of that. Okay, so this proves that the action is properly discontinuous. Um, let me remark that the action is not free. Uh, so, um, so the action of the mapping class group on Titanus space um, is not free. Um, so this is because if you look at a hyperbolic surface with some symmetry. Okay, so if you look at, a, um, so consider, take a hyperbolic surface uh, in this Teichmuller space with uh, uh, some symmetry. So, so suppose you have, let's say, a, a genus uh, three curve. So then you can have something like this, you know, one of these fidget spinners. So, okay, so this is symmetric. So you have this order three um, rotation, which, which is an, an isometry of, of this hyperbolic surface. Okay, so, um, so our, uh, we can write in some notation that, um, um, so, so phi uh, is some, something in automorphisms of this so hyperbolic surface of X, Phi is some automorphism, so uh, so phi x to x is an isometry. You already know that hyperbolic surfaces, I mean, you can only have finitely many such uh, isometry automorphisms. So, um, so if, if phi is something like this, it's also a mapping class, of course, it's a homeomorphism of the surface to itself, okay? So the claim is that then is your phi, so then this, uh, Phi is a mapping class. So phi is also belongs to the mapping class group of uh, this surface. Uh, okay, so uh, this S, S is the sort of underlying surface. So then phi, um, so then this the surface X is a fixed point of the, of the action. So then what happens if you look at a phi acting on, so, so let's say you have marked uh, X, okay, so you, you uh, look at this. So then, um, well, this is, uh, by the definitional action is something like this. So if you have, um, so this is the picture. You have a marking X, and then um, you hit it with phi. Okay, so. But now, you, by the definition, there is an equivalence relation in this 
Dijkmuller space the way we defined it. So, so I claim that this is now equivalent to XF. That's be just because um, you have this commutative diagram. Right? So, um, and, and this means that this new surface with this new marking, this is an isometry. It just means that this pair marking and this pair are equivalent to the same point in Dijkmuller space. Okay? So I'm just kind of uh, unraveling that definition. So, so indeed, I mean, this XF, um, it gives you a, a, a fixed point of, the, of this action. So this phi is some non-trivial mapping class. It's not homotopic to the identity map, but it fixes this surface in Titan space. And indeed, one can show that, uh, um, so uh, any su such, uh, so, um, so, there, so any fixed point is, comes from such a symmetric kind of picture like this. So the action it turns out to be not free, but uh, uh, it's always like this. So it's uh, so in some some sense, what you get is a quotient. So so the mapping class group action on Dijkmuller space is properly discontinuous but not free. You get something which is quotient, but this, it turns out the, the fixed the points which are the, where the freeness fails are exactly like this with finite stabilizers. Remember that uh, a, a hyperbolic surface. It has only finitely many symmetries. So you get what is called an orbifold and not a, okay, so something slightly worse than a manifold, but getting something not too bad either. Okay, so the so moduli space is, uh, has these some kind of um, these points where uh, uh, it's, they're corresponding to these things with finite symmetries. So, um, all right, so, uh, so this is sort of a remark uh, because we have been earlier looking at properly discontinuous actions with. Uh, which were also free, but here they're actually not quite free. Okay, the other um, sort of note is the other remark is that this quotient, uh, which is the uh, moduli space with its Dijkmuller space quotient with, with the mapping class group action, uh, this quotient is not compact. Okay, so it's not. Not even. Not only is it not free, it's uh, the it's not co-compact co in action. And why is this true? So, um, so 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 here's the uh, kind of just to have some picture. So here's tighten the space, and uh, you're sort of quotienting it and getting moduli space. The claim is that it's not a compact space. It can sort of diverge out, and this is. Uh, so this you can see by, you can produce a sequence of elements which look like this. So a sequence of surfaces, so consider a sequence of hyperbolic surfaces Xn um, such that, so which, which uh, let me draw the picture first. So uh, this, in the sequence, I say you start with some X0. And then along this way, you, you start having shorter and shorter curves. So let's say here this curve gamma has some length, and along the way you kind of you start pinching curves. So Xn is sort of where this uh, sort of curve, some curve is short. Curve is, let's say, less than some, um, I don't know, epsilon n, where uh, epsilon n goes to uh, zero. Okay, so, uh, so in other words, the I want the length, of, I want some short curve on the surface, okay? So, um, so length of, so, and these are hyperbolic surfaces, let's say in the, in the moduli space. So you can't talk of a length of a specific curve because there's no marking, but you can say that the length of some of the sh curve is less than epsilon. N. So length of the shortest uh, uh, geodesic, um, uh, yeah, geodesic on Xn. So this uh, number is less than epsilon n, where epsilon n goes to zero as n tends to infinity. Okay, so so you can easily produce such a sequence of hyperbolic surfaces. Okay, now uh, now this uh, so this number is is not is independent of is invariant under the action of the mapping class group because that mapping class group will only permute the curves on the surface. Uh, the length of the shortest curve remains the same. 
Okay, so in other words, so if you want, so let's say your XNs were, uh, let me draw it in moduli space. It's X, X1, X2, X0, X1, 2, and so on. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, so consider, uh, so they're sort of coming from some points. You consider some lifts, uh, x1 till x0 tilde, x1 tilde, and so on in Tychnula space. You can't bring them back to some compact set by a mapping class. Because on a compact set, the length of the shortest geodesic uh, will be bounded below. Okay, So you can't uh, this, uh, you bring these uh, back to some compact set. Uh, by, by a mapping class. So these indeed uh, lie in, uh, so the, if you, if any sort of set of lifts of this can't lie in some compact set. So they exit every compact set here. They can't belong to some kind, some uh, compact set in, in, the, in the moduli space. If we start with a compact set in moduli space, there would have been a lift in, uh, in tight Muller space, which is compact. All the points would have lived there. That cannot happen because of this. Okay, so. Um, so th this is uh, made more precise in the following um, theorem. So I wanted to do this too, but I don't think I have time. So let me just uh, say what is the, the theorem of, it's called the Mumford compactness criterion. Um, it says that if you fix any epsilon, then um, if you look at the subset of moduli space, which consists of all those points, all those hyperbolic surfaces, um, such that uh, x, uh, the shortest, so the length of the shortest geodesic on x is less than epsilon, less than, let's say, equal to epsilon. So then this is a compact set. Sorry, uh, length of the shot is, yeah, sorry, greater than, is a, co a compact set. Okay, so this is the epsilon thick part. Okay, so this, uh, this would mean that uh, um, your moduli space is kind of exhausted by, um, so these as epsilon goes to zero, you, you're allowed to have uh, so, so, so the consequence is that your moduli space is, uh, is exhaust as this kind of compact exhaustion. It's sort of epsilon n goes to zero and m epsilon s. So there's some kind of, uh, so these compact pieces. As you go further out, these, uh, each of these surfaces would have sh some short curve, because less than epsilon. And so, so the, this is the way that you can um, diverge in moduli space. So the way to diverge in moduli space is by sort of pinching some curve. Okay, so, so let me uh, actually end with uh, sort of the, uh, so coming back to Teichmuller space. So, so the, how do you diverge in Teichmuller space? Um, so the firstly, so you can, well, if you pinch a curve, you diverge not only in moduli space, I mean, you'll be diverging Teichmuller space as well, right? So this is something, so ways to diverge is sort of, is one is to pinch a curve, so so it's just like there. So here, here's Teichmuller space. As you pinch a curve, you would be kind of going out in Teichmuller space, and the projections are also going out in moduli space. Okay, so uh, this is one way. Uh, and the second way that we've learned how to uh, diverge in Teichmuller space is uh, you can also iterate um, mapping classes. Okay, so suppose, um, so here's the picture again, this is moduli space. Um, so suppose I start with some marked surface. So here's the marking. Uh, here's some hyperbolic, fixed hyperbolic surface. That's some point, like no space. You can change the, so the marking is also given by these dual curves. So if you, if you change the marking that, by twisting along some curve, many, many times, okay? So that's going to mean that you are doing these Dane twists. So some power of a Dane twist here. Okay, so Dane, Dane twist along some, uh, along some curve and you're sort of iterating this, getting more and more. So then 
you would be acting by the mapping class group, like the, that element, where the cyclic subgroup generated by that uh, uh, Dane twist. And you've seen that the mapping class group action is properly discontinuous. So the orbits cannot remain in some compact set. So it will, it will sort of go off to infinity. On the, in the quotient, you get a single point because it's the quotient. Um, uh, and and so, uh, so, uh, so you have these uh, two ways of, uh, of diverging in Teichmuller space, as uh, some people, Mahan, like to call it, that two ways of killing a, a, a hyperbolic surface. One is uh, throttling it, and the other way, wringing its neck. Okay, so these are the two. <laughs> so, this is, so on that, uh, well, anyway, so, and, and you can uh, sort of do combinations, and combinations of uh, one and two. Okay, so, um, and, uh, there are various uh, now sort of problems that now you can think of, uh, for example, uh, what's the boundary, okay, how do you diverge, how can you make sense of the boundary of Teichmuller spaces, like you've been uh, looking at boundaries of hyperbolic spaces, turns out Teichmuller space is not quite a hyperbolic space, but you can still talk of some kind of boundary, and, and so uh, there are various uh, questions like, there is things like that, that um, that, that uh, you can sort of continue with. Anyway, so now I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. <laughs>